I think we'll take, we'll have to kind of shorten the question period because um, there is a book signing, but then there's also the, um, uh, we, we have, the, the closing ceremonies are like 12.15 or something? 12.30. Oh, <laughs> we can do more questions. Yes, sir. Hi. Tons of time. Thank you very much for uh, coming and speaking to all of us. Um, I was just recently talking to my sister, who was here with me, and she's a biology major at uh, university, the University of Northern Iowa. And we were talking about, before we started speaking, how depressing it is that she will be in the same degree as people who as biology majors still don't fully accept evolution and how at the very least they should probably have an asterisk at the end of their at the end of their degree that says they're history deniers as Professor Dawkins calls them in his new book. And um, my question is, do you think that high school and college faculty just aren't are, are too nice and aren't forceful enough to let these people know that Evolution is, for all intents and purposes, a fact. Well, I don't know how you can force someone to accept a scientific idea. I mean, you know, be more forceful in, in what sense? You don't whack somebody over the head because they don't accept, you know, this enzyme being involved in cell division. But I take your point, and I, I really want to underscore it. Um, my biggest gripe, frankly, is with my fellow college professors. I'm a recovering college professor myself. Um, I don't think college professors are doing a very good job teaching evolution. If high school teachers come out of four years of college, and some of them are biology majors, right? They don't understand evolution. That's not the fault of the education department. That's the fault of the arts and science biology department and geology department and astronomy department. We can do a whole lot better job of teaching evolution to undergraduates. After all, people who graduate from college go on to become school board members, go on to become teachers, go on to become captains of industry and, and voters. And we need to have, we need to do a much better job teaching the nature of science and teaching what evolution really is. You know, I was, I travel a lot and speak a lot at campuses around the country. And um, usually I'm invited by the science departments. I do a talk for them and I'll do a public lecture as well. And one of the things I always ask the uh, biology department people is, do you require a course in evolution for your biology majors? And oftentimes there's a certain amount of squirming going on because they haven't quite gotten around to doing that yet. And I say, well, when are you going to catch up to Brigham Young? Of course, what needs to be done at the university level, in the biology departments, is to bring evolution into every single class. Not save it for the course in evolution, but bring it into every single course, every single class, at least once a week. Figure out how, those of you who are scientists, figure out how you can bring the idea of common ancestry into biochemistry, molecular biology, organismic biology, uh, population biology, it's easy there, um, to <laughs> in ecology as well. Next question. You mentioned that the article that new scientists on that are being transferred into health. Are you saying that new scientists are publishing all science or just that it's misconstrued? The, the question had to do with the new science uh, cover. The article itself wasn't that bad, although, you know, sometimes scientists don't think very think about how they phrase things. And you can phrase things in ways that don't mislead the public. There were some phrasings that I would certainly have appreciated a little more thoughtfulness there. But basically, the article wasn't bad. The article was talking about how at the single-celled organism level, uh, the level of, of archaea and protists and stuff like that, you have a lot of swapping around of genetic information. Now, more than one person in the article pointed out that once you get to multiple-celled organisms, once you get to metazoa, oh yeah, you get trees. It's just the little stuff, you know, it's just the single-cell stuff, which it's really complicated. That doesn't, that's not an argument against evolution. But the goofballs at New Scientist had this big splashy cover, Darwin was wrong. Well, give me a break, Darwin didn't know anything about horizontal gene transfer. How could Darwin be wrong? The idea being is that, that there's no tree of life anymore. Well, that's just nonsense. If the bottom of the tree is a banyan, that doesn't mean that there's not a tree, right? Um, 
Once you get metazoa, you get trees. Not a big deal. So my beef with uh, New Scientist is that if they want to have a flashy cover that will get people to buy the magazine, I don't have a problem with that. But don't do something that is going to deliberately mislead the public about what evolution is. You know, National Geographic had a really great cover a couple years ago. Was Darwin wrong? I imagine a lot of people picked that cover, you know, picked up that issue of National Geographic to see if Darwin was wrong. And you open it up and says, no. <laughs> And what I might uh, add was about 94 uh, point type, <laughs> so you could, couldn't miss it. Yes, sir. Um, uh, everyone's familiar with the claim that there's no transitional forms, and we have so few fossils and everything. And um, you have all these wonderful skulls up there, either the best specimens or the type specimens of the species they represent. And I'm wondering, could the fact that we show the same pictures of the same you know, a dozen skulls over and over and over again instead of emphasizing the hundreds and thousands of fossils which all match, you know, different parts of, of, the, of the overall skeleton. Could that be causing uh, part of the problem with people not accepting that there are actually thousands of fossils? I, I mean... I don't think we're overusing any particular example. Um, the big idea that you and I would both support is that we need to inform the public that there are wonderful transitional series. Uh, Don Prothero's book, if you haven't taken a look at it out there, and even bought it, it's a good book. Um, Don's book has got marvelous stuff about whales, about horses. You know, there's lots of sequences that, that show really, really good um, gradual change through time, and even more so when you get into invertebrates. So um, I, I don't think that people are saturated with, um, with uh, the same old examples. I think they just don't know in general what the examples are. One slide that I use that's very effective, I think, in, in, in public audiences is a slide that was prepared by uh, an NCSC member whose name now escapes me, and I'll really be embarrassed since this is going to be on the Internet and I'm not giving him credit for it. But it's a slide showing from the earliest Australopithecines, well, this is pre artipithecus but, you know, the earliest Austral Australopithecines up until modern humans. And, you know, I show this and say, okay, draw a line. Where's the ape? Where's the human? And, of course, it's impossible. Because even, even if you only look at skulls, you can't, you know, we, we have such a variety now that we can't even, we can't, um, we can't say that there is hard and fast lines between them. Thank you for your question. We'll have one more question, please. Thank you. Um, are there protections in these academic, academic freedom acts for the teacher who refuses to bring in all of it? Well, because they're permissive, you don't have to bring it in. But what if a parent or a student in the classroom wants uh, the alternate theories brought in? Can the teacher be protected from being forced to bring it in? It depends on the wording of the law. Uh, in, in several uh, manifestations, it wouldn't matter because the teacher can make the decision. The law is written in terms of the teacher's right to do A, B, or C. But the point being, even if the law uh, it reads one way literally, it is still the case that teachers find laws like this highly intimidating. And I think the net effect of these kinds of laws is just the teachers don't get around to teaching evolution this year. <coughs> just couldn't get to it. It's kind of in the back of the book anyway, and we had to spend so much time memorizing the enzymes and photosynthesis. So um, we, we have much more problem in the United States with teachers skipping evolution than we do with the actual frank teaching of creationism. And, but that former is a major problem if your concern is with um, public understanding of science and science literacy. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your conference.